Welcome to the sixth COVID-19 communityresources.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. We have a really special guest today. We have our own U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown, and he's going to talk about racial disparities in these COVID-19 cases and what's being done about them and what can be done about all the racial disparities. So we've got a lot to talk about. Um, joining us uh, today will be Renee Mahaffey Harris, President and CEO of the Center for Closing the Health Gap, Eddie Cohen of the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio, Eric Kearney, President and CEO of the African American Chamber, and Joe Mallory, Vice President of the NAACP. Um, I want to give a quick shout out, a huge thank you to our tech team, John Reichel and also Lauren Hardin. They make all of this magic happen. Um, I want to remind you that we are taping this session so that we can post it later. I also want to remind you that Senator Brown wants to hear from you. So you can start posting questions right now as I speak. If you're on Zoom, put your questions on the Q&A. And if you're on Facebook, just put them into the chat and we will get to them later. So I would like to ask Renee Mahaffey Harris, President and CEO of the Center for Closing the Health Gap, to introduce her friend, Senator Sherrod Brown. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very excited to introduce Senator Sherrod Brown, who I worked for many years ago. Um, U.S. Senator Brown is a native of Mansfield, Ohio. He graduated from Yale University and then the Ohio State University. Prior to being elected to the U.S. Senate, he was a school teacher, a member of the Ohio Assembly, a Secretary of State of Ohio, and a United States Representative for Ohio's 13th District. Senator Brown has was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2006. He is married to Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Connie Schultz. They have three daughters and seven grandchildren. And please join me in welcoming Senator Sherrod Brown. Welcome, welcome, Senator Brown. We are going to turn the program over to you. I know you have a lot to tell us and we have a lot of questions. So thank you so much. Yeah, Michelle, thank you. And uh, Eddie, good to see you again. And okay. Eric, and especially Renee. Renee and I worked together three decades ago. So, and I got to meet remotely today her daughter Sloan, who is home uh, for the summer, for the spring, the summer, and I hope not in the fall so she can go back to school, but um, I don't enter into those family discussions. So um, thanks, and thanks thanks for being part of this. And uh, for the next hour or so, I just really wanna hear from you and hear your questions and your thoughts. Uh, you all know what this pandemic has meant uh, to communities all over this state and all over this country. Um, Renee has been on a number of conference calls with me uh, with uh, leaders and activists uh, in the minority communities around Ohio. And uh, we, know, we know the bad news and we know that some, someone at a community health center said to me that this, this pandemic really looks like, it really has been a, the great revealer for our country. And while most of you on this call, and certainly the leaders on this call, people like Joe Mallory and Dr. Walker and all of you and, and uh, Councilwoman Kearney all recognize all knew already the what the racial disparities and what this great reveal that this, this these revelations are to many in this country they're not revelations to most of you on this call that the the um the disparities in income and in housing and wealth and health and education uh the the digital divide is even more pronounced um those of you that that whether you're in the Cincinnati public schools or the Blue Ash schools or the Springfield schools, you can see the kids that have that are that are more affluent and are, are often have continue their advantages in the classroom remote um, versus those that don't have a Chromebook or the school or don't have a hotspot or don't have Wi-Fi. And we know we need to address those. We know in housing. Um, from slavery to Jim Crow to redlining to what the Trump administration is doing right now to try to lock in so many of these discriminatory features of our housing. Uh, we know that 40% of the job losses um, in this country, 40% have taken place among citizens, make families making less than 40,000 or individuals making less than $40,000 a year. We know all those facts. 
if anything good comes out of this pandemic, it's, if anything good comes out, it's gonna be the recognition from our society that come January, especially if we have a new president and a new Senate, and this is not a political call, but if, if we do, um, one of the top priorities, one of the top two or three priorities in our country have, has to be to address these disparities in life expectancy, maternal mortality, infant mortality, housing, uh, education, uh, gener intergenerational wealth, all the things that, that decades of Jim Crow and discrimination have wrought in our country and how, how we have failed as a nation, uh, simply failed as a nation to keep up. Uh, one, I'm, I'm working on legislation with Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Elizabeth Warren on requiring getting the Health and Human Services Department nationally to require every county health department in Hamilton County and everywhere else. Some counties are, are doing it, many aren't, to gather the data so we really, as, as this epidemic eventually, well, this pandemic eventually winds down, we actually we actually have the data and the demogra demographic information, uh, gender, race, income, all the things that will help us better um, address these disparities and, and, and that, that, that afflict, that continue to afflict so many in our society, really afflict all of us, even those who have, were born to more advantage. It, it makes our society poorer and weaker and, and less humane, the fact that we allow all this to happen. Um, I, I am, I, some of you may, some of you may know that my office is working with, with Renee Mahaffey Harris on a conference this fall to a Black Women's Health Symposium in Cincinnati. Um, we still plan to go forward one way or another with it. Uh, whether, or not, whether or not Sloan goes back to college or not for in the fall, we're gonna, gonna try to go ahead with it in, in some form. So um, I will stop there. I, I only would say one more thing. I, you know, we, we, there, are, there are sort of three groups of people, three groups of workers in our country today. There are those of us who are privileged enough to get to work at home and still get paid. There are the 36 and counting million people who are laid off. And then there's the millions and millions of workers, you know, well over a million in Ohio who are considered essential workers, where worker workers who are um, who are generally moderate income workers, think of who they are. They're not they're not just doctors and, and nurses. They are the people that do the laundry at, at University Hospital. They're the they're the bus driver in Cincinnati. 35 bus drivers in this country have died from coronavirus. 35 at last count. Um, they're the shelf. They're the shelf stockers at Kroger. Uh, they're the custodians and the security people in the food service preparers. They're people who are mostly women and disproportionately people of color. Those are people that go to work every day, knowing they're they're coming in contact with some people probably who have the virus co-workers or customers then they have the anxiety of going home to their families knowing they could infect them those are often workers making 12 and 15 dollars an hour they're again more likely to be disproportionately people of color they're more, most likely to be women um, and they are paid inadequately and if if we call them essential workers we ought to pay them that way and one of the things I'm working on legislatively is, is with Joyce Beatty and some others is pandemic pay. So these workers who are working in these jobs at 12 to 15 to 18 dollars an hour get extra pay from the federal government for the period of the pandemic. We owe them two things. We owe them protection in the workplace and President Trump has failed miserably in building a national effort to get protective equipment to workers of all kinds as he's failed to scale up testing, making us less safe and ill preparing us for the, for the uh, economy reopening. Um, we owe them that and we owe them this extra pay. That's part of Speaker Pelosi's, uh, the legislation that passed the House. It's legislation I worked on to, to get them to pass and it's gonna be in the Senate. Um, we're gonna fight like hell to have that pandemic pay or heroes bonus call it either one in, in this legislation. So um, I'll stop there and, and love to hear your questions and uh, just identify yourself when you ask a question, if you would, and tell me your affiliation, if you have any, or where you live or something about you, and um, if you're willing to, and I'd love to hear from anybody. So the rest of the hour is yours. Thanks again, John Michelle. Mr. Brown, thank you so much. That was a lot of um, really good information to get us started. Um, I did not introduce, and so let me do that quickly, uh, Dr. Roosevelt Walker, 
Dr. Walker, you want to just wave your hand? Um, and Dr. Walker, there you go, is president of the Cincinnati Medical Association. So, so Dr. Walker, thank you for joining us. Um, let me ask quickly, um, uh, Senator Brown, and you mentioned uh, the equitable data collection and disclosure on COVID-19 Act, but could you tell us a little bit, there's another um, a piece of legislation that you and Senator Kamala Harris have together, um, and I think it's called the COVID-19 Racial and Ethnic Disparities Task Force Act. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we want, uh, you know, the, the, the worst thing that could happen is once this, um, once this pandemic is in the rearview mirror, and it will be someday, unfortunately, not as soon as, as the president says, probably because of his, um, his incompetent leadership or worse, and not as soon as some governors say, but when, whenever it is, we can't go back to the same old, same old. And so Senator Harris and I worked with, with Senator Warren and worked on legislation to gather the data. We then, I should have mentioned that in my opening remarks, I apologize. We then want to put together a task force of people who really understand this, uh, like people on this call that can help us figure out how we address these issues. I mean, these are, these are long held, obviously long, um, calcified, deeply embedded policies and practices in our society. I mean, again, going back to Jim Crow or before and then redlining and then what happens with housing today. The same with medical care, the same with education. Uh, we know many things we need to do, but we don't need know all we need to do. And we wanna, we wanna keep shining a spotlight on, on those practices so we can better address them. Next year, if, if the Democrats win the Senate, I'll be chairman of the Senate. It's always been called the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. I, I refer to it as the Senate Housing Committee um, because it does, it's never emphasized housing enough. And to me, everything begins and ends with housing. 25% of all Americans who rent pay half their income in housing. So one thing goes wrong in their lives. Their kid gets sick. They, they, um, their car breaks down. Uh, they get injured on the job and miss a week of work, minor injury and everything can, they, they can lose their home and they can, they, and everything turns upside down. And we know that there, there are two books for people that are particularly interested in that two books I recommend. One is called Evicted and about people, this, this gentleman lived in Milwaukee with um, a number of, of uh, in, a, in a white, uh, in, a, in a white neighborhood and mostly um, a manufactured housing and trailer park. And then in the black neighborhoods of Milwaukee, and saw what happens with families that face eviction and what happens to them after. The other is a book called The Color of Law. And that, that book really does paint the historical picture of, of housing discrimination and how it continues to this day. And uh, that, that, that to me, if we fix, if we really could deal with, you know, it, it's, also, it's also intergenerational wealth and that uh, you know, African American families don't have the same wealth than the average in white families because African Americans couldn't buy homes in neighborhoods where the home price would appreciate, and were often turned away into substandard housing. We know all that. Uh, this committee that Senator Harris and I, uh, Senator um, Harris and I, um, are working are working to form could help us in a significant way address that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Joe Mallory has joined us. Joe, I don't think you were here when I introduced you, but you just might want to wave. So Joe Mallory is the vice president of Cincinnati branch of the NAACP. Thanks for joining us. And we'll probably have some other folks coming on. So, okay. So the first question uh, is from Eric. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, does Senator Brown uh, have a forecast for the U.S. economy? Um, yeah, but it means about as much as any, anybody else's forecast. I, I just think I'm very concerned that, that um, this is less of a forecast and more of an observation. I, I'm very concerned about some of these um, cowboy, um, mini Trump, M-I-N-I, mini Trump governors in the South in Georgia where they stole the election from Stacey Abrams in Florida and uh, where they may or may not have stolen the election in Texas. Uh, where these governors are opening the economy much, much faster. I worry about the rate of infection. I'm concerned about, I think Governor DeWine's done this very well. I mean, I will very publicly say, and I have, Governor DeWine's actions, and Governor DeWine and I have not always been political allies, as you know, but, so this isn't a partisan thing, but Governor DeWine's action has saved, America, saved Ohioans' lives because he addressed this early. Uh, President Trump's actions have, have killed Americans, frankly. 
Um, we've seen far too many Americans get sick and die. We are we are five percent of the world's population, yet we've had 31, 32 percent of all the deaths in the world in this country. Uh, and there's just no, no the reason for that is bad presidential leadership. So I I, I think Governor Dewine opening the government, opening the economy at this pace is more cautious. I still am concerned about it. The worst thing that could happen is infections infections climb dramatically. I, I, I'm not sure of that in Ohio. I think in some of those other states, it's more likely. But there are no walls around Texas and Florida and Georgia either, and people move from place to place. Um, but if, if infections go up, what happens to the economy? Then do they have to close the schools again or close down restaurants and, and other places again? Um, that's my concern. That's why I said two things need to happen as we open the economy. One is um, we've got to protect workers, and Ohio has not done enough to protect workers on the job, especially the new workers coming back, the, the workers coming back into the workplace. And second, we've got to do much more extensive testing uh, and contact tracing, meaning when somebody's tested positive, uh, some, some workers, some tele people that we hire, uh, and there should be, there need to be thousands of them in Ohio, um, call that person, find out whom they've been in contact with over the last two weeks, begin to interview people. Dr. Walker knows all about this, what we need to do, and, and begin to isolate those people that might have come into contact. That's the only way, you know, we, we've mostly flattened the curve in Ohio, but the only way to make it go down is, is more testing, contact tracing. Then once people feel safer, then they're going to go start going back to movie theaters and start going back to retail shops and start going back to work and feel a lot more comfortable about it. And uh, we just simply haven't done that much of anywhere in the country as extensively as we need to. That's right, okay. And you mentioned Governor DeWine. So let me take, uh, I'm gonna take this next question that is about Governor DeWine. And it says, Governor DeWine allowed restaurants to reopen yesterday for outdoor dining and then indoor dining next Friday. The Cincinnati is not even on a downward trend yet. It looks like more people are getting sick. I don't get it. Well, I have not, I've been hesitant to second guess the governor because I think he's shown better leadership um, than the great majority of governors in the country. Uh, I think Dr. Acton has been a star. Um, I think she has um, given good advice and Governor DeWine's had the good sense to follow the advice. I think Governor DeWine is under pressure to open things faster uh, than I would hope he would. Um, I have those same concerns your caller has or your person who emailed you has um, that, uh, that is restaurants open. I mean, I, I, and the, 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 probably the worst thing about that, uh, Jan Michelle, is that, that the president has not put out guidelines on how to reopen. In other words, if, you're gonna, if you run a restaurant, how are you going to reconfigure your tables? Are you going to even things as simple as you're going to put salt and pepper shakers on the restaurant tables? I've heard restaurants shouldn't. Um, for instance, because everybody touches them and how often do they wipe them down? How many people should sit in the restaurant? How, how do you, what do you do to reconfigure for airflow? Uh, do the waiters all wear masks? Do you have, do you have Purell on the tables? Uh, do you do things like that? And that guidance, the president has not allowed that guidance to inform business owners um, before they come back. So I, I worry about the employees of those restaurants. I worry about the patrons. Uh, the employee, the, the other, the other catch twenty two here, is many people are receiving unemployment. The, the, unfortunately, this, the Trump's Department of Labor has been way too slow getting out the checks, um, getting the the, ma the machinery moving to get checks out. It's also a hold up in the state because there's they've gotten so many applications, obviously so many filings. But um, I, I just I, if you're if you're on unemployment right now and you're called back to work, you've got to go back to work. Uh, or you lose your unemployment. You lose your unemployment if you refuse to, and so that puts workers in a position where they've got to think. Well, I don't think it's safe to go back to work, but I but I need that fourteen dollars an hour, so I got to go back to work, and I I, I I worry about that for our country. Right. Right. Okay. Um, the next question is: uh, the black population in Ohio is only about 12%, but I heard that COVID-19 cases were almost twice that rate. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, we've talked about that. I, the, the numbers, I, I hear the numbers are 12%. State's about 12% African-American, about 20% of the deaths. So it's close to twice, twice as much. It's, the, it's all of the decades 
of discrimination and racism in this country that we still haven't recognized um, the way that we should. And I, as I said, I maybe the only good thing come, that comes out of this is there are a whole lot of people that look like me who are going to say, oh, they should have known this already. A lot of us did, but policymakers haven't dealt with it. And I know, I mean, Eddie's working on it with the Urban League. That's one, and, and, and Joe at the NACP. It's, it's, it's things that they do all the time. It's what Renee's doing uh, with her healthcare work. Um, and it's, it's time that, and I, I, I do think, I, mean, I talked to some, and again, this isn't a political message, but I, I talked to Vice President Biden's, um, one of his closest assistants last night for about an hour. Um, and this is one of the major things they think they want to deal with come January, and if he's president. Uh, and I think there are a few things. I mean, I, I would put the, the, the I would put the most important moral issues in our society we deal with come January are climate, climate change, and racial disparities. I think that those are those are two, frankly, moral questions and justice issues that. If we don't address, we are we become an unrecognizable society in the next 25 years. Okay. Okay, this next question is from Lisa Kelly. And I should tell attendees, um, we love it when you give your name. If you want to be anonymous, that's fine as well. So Lisa's question is, how do we ensure that the voting in November is fair? Um, that's a question we're wrestling with because uh, we have tried, uh, we, we've seen a number of things happen. We saw the terrible pictures in Milwaukee of people standing in line, many with masks, many not, many of them six feet apart, many not. Uh, we, they stood in line for hours because the Republican Supreme Court in a party line vote, first the legislature, then the state Supreme Court, then the U.S. Supreme Court, which isn't supposed to be partisan, but was their vote of the election should go on. Uh, it was wrong. There have been, the last count I, I heard were 15 people uh, were infected during that period. They can't prove it was standing in line, but it very likely was. Um, we know that will happen more. We know that will keep people away from the polls. President Trump has said he's against mail-in voting because there won't be any Republicans elected if we mail-in vote. I don't believe that. I think that mail-in voting is just what we ought to do, I think. And that's what we're trying to do in Congress in the next coronavirus package. Um, to put literally, we, we've listened to we've listened to Stacey Abrams, the former minority leader, uh, the Democratic leader in in Georgia, um, who uh, has put together a four four billion dollar plan on voting so that we have early voting for at least three weeks before the election, including Sunday, so you can do souls to the polls, so that we have mail in voting for everybody. It's called no excuses mail in voting. And that simply means that you don't have to say you're out of town or disabled or old or anything. You just can get a absentee ballot. And then um, election day too, you have three choices, early voting, mail, or election day. Uh, and we should make the early, we should make the mail-in easier. The secretaries of state should send out actual ballots, not applications, because then it's a three-step process. Ask for the application, get the application, mail the application, get it back and then mail in a ballot. And why put that extra step and frankly, extra cost on potentially the voter and on the boards of elections in Hamilton County or Claremont County or Warren County or anywhere else in the state. So um, we, are, we are struggling with that. The, the, the best answer though, is because I don't trust McConnell, I don't trust the president um, to do this, right? To protect, we know about voter suppression every election and they're getting better and more sophisticated at it. Um, the best way to defeat it is we do early voting like we've never done it before. And I mean, I, I've, I've, I've stood at early voting places in Hamilton County and Franklin County and Cuyahoga County. I see the lines. Um, we've got we've to organize a steady stream of early voters for those three weeks leading into the election. Centered around souls to the polls, but it's not church attendees I worry about. People that go to church um, typically are voters. It's voters who are not as regular voters. They don't vote every year. They don't vote every four years, um, especially young voters. If we have, if young voters vote in large numbers, they're the ones that best understand climate change. And they're the ones in all races that best understand racial disparities. Um, young people, young whites, young Latinas, young African-Americans, young Asian-Americans, they understand diversity. They understand racial disparities. 
they understand climate and what's going to happen to their generation when some of us that are older on this call, and I won't mention any names, but some of us that are older aren't probably going to be around when the, when the really awful stuff hits from, from climate denial, from 20 years of, of interest group, Koch brother, oil companies, climate denial. All right, there you go. So now Joe Mallory's question is kind of similar, and he's saying, um, is there a federal contingency plan if there's a second surge of COVID-19 and it gets close to the November election? Um, thanks, Joe. Um, there really isn't. I mean, there is, we want to have a plan, but President Trump is, President Trump doesn't have great interest in pulling off a fair election. I mean, he, he got help. He, you know, he, he continues to talk about the Mueller report. I don't want to get into that. It's clear that almost in unanimity among experts, uh, intelligence people, even, even Republican members of the Senate, many of them acknowledge, and they all know, they just don't want to say that the Russians clearly helped Donald Trump be elected president. Uh, we know all those things. We know that Trump, Trump really doesn't think he can win without cheating. I think that's really clear. And so the contingency plan is we've got to outwork them and get, get our people to the polls. And especially, you know, especially students at Cincinnati State, and especially young, young men and women who graduated from, um, you know, that might have graduated from Withrow High School and went off to the military. Um, getting young McDonald's workers and, and, and construction workers to the polls. If they do, um, they, they, can't, they can't cheat. I don't want to sound cynical, but they can't cheat their way into this election if, if we do that. So it really, it's really on us. It shouldn't be. It should be on government to do it right, but it's really on all of us to make sure government does it right. Okay. All right, this next question is from Kelly Prather. And she says, Senator Brown, thank you so much for addressing the issue of housing. One major concern where there are extreme health disparities is senior housing, which includes assisted living facilities and independent living. A lot of the residents in these facilities are susceptible to COVID-19. It would be great if there were real oversight where our seniors' health is concerned. Do you have plans to address the issues with senior housing development? Well, it's um, that's a really hard question, Ms. Crazer, and to, 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 to change policy in the middle of this coronavirus and protect them. I mean, I, I think that the governor is sensitive to, I know I, I, talk, to, I talk to him fairly often, I talk to Dr. Um, Acton pretty often, they, they are both sensitive to housing issues in the sense that where, where are people most likely, people seem to be able, see people seem to contract the coronavirus in, in two or three kinds of places. Um, social gatherings, that's weddings, funerals, especially now, things like that. Um, workplace and home. And think again about who's putting aside the funerals and the weddings. People in the workplace are over, many people of color in the workplace, many making moderately, moderate or low wages. Then the home is in, in, in homes of low income people and senior, senior complexes are generally pretty low income people usually. People are packed together much more closely with much less um, access to good sanitation and all the things you need. I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not even a doctor, so I, I, speak, I speak in um, not great depth about this, but it's pretty clear it's, it's, it's all about housing too. And that's, that's one reason housing is so damn important long range. So this kind of thing can't happen again. But um, I know public health departments are concerned about housing. Um, the federal, federal HUD, Housing and Urban Development, it's not shown the concern it should. We're, we're fighting with them to try to get Dr. Um, Dr. Carson uh, the secretary of HUD, the Trump nominee for HUD, to try to get him to pay more attention to these housing complexes. But we know those are, you know, not not as bad as nursing homes in terms of outbreaks, but are, are pretty serious. So, Ms. Crather, thank you. I, I wish I had a more optimistic answer on that for now. Thank you so much. Okay, this next question is from Eddie Cohen. Um, Eddie, and I, I should say, I'm not sure if you were on when we introduced you, but, but thank you for joining us. And as I said, he's president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio. And his question, um, he says, um, Senator Brown, would you please speak to the attempts to roll back civil rights uh, in reference to reopening? How do we balance supporting businesses reopening and the basic protections of workers' rights? 
yeah, I mean, workers' rights are civil rights and workers' rights are women's rights and worker rights, it's, you know, workers are not just, uh, you know, the white male firefighters union workers or the McDonald's workers and the uh, people that do the laundry at, at Christ Hospital and the people that um, are the security and the food, food like the janitors that clean downtown office buildings and, and um, middle class workers at Kroger or whatever. Um, that's to me the fundamentally what's what's it again that's probably why one of the reasons that 20 percent of the deaths in the state are african-american as opposed to 12 percent of the population it's african-americans that are more in the workplace in higher percentages i don't know of people actually working today in the workplace i would guess it's at least 20 percent african-american i i don't know that anybody's gathered those statistics but i would guess just like people that are privileged enough to work at home and get paid are probably less than 12% African American because those are the jobs. That's the way the the jobs are made up. But we have seen a pattern of voter suppression. Uh, we've seen a Supreme Court that always picks corporations over workers and always picks uh, conservative politics over civil rights. Look at what they did in the Shelby v. Holder case, was suing President Obama on voting rights. Um, look at what's happened on um, uh, and, and that's I mean that's. That's what our fight is. It's on voter rights. It's on worker rights. It's on civil rights generally, uh, and uh, the, the 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 fight is the, the fight is ongoing. We know it will never end, but we also know we've we've lost too many times recently, um, especially since President Obama left the White House. Right. Okay. Now these next two questions are both related to schools. So one one question is: Do you think it's safe for schools and colleges to open up? for in-person classes in the fall. And then Lisa Kelly says, and when school starts in August, and I guess that's if school starts in August, how will we address the issues of COVID-19? I, I don't, thank you for that again, Lisa, for waiting. And I, I don't think we know that. I, I can't predict, and it's not my place to do that, to predict what's gonna happen in the fall. Uh, my conversations with the governor and with Dr. Acton is they, they don't know yet either. Um, the goal, of course, is to open the schools in the fall. Uh, you know, you, you think about, I mean, you, my, my, one, of my, one of the questions that I don't think our policymakers have answered is when, you know, in the summertime, people say, well, kids get along in the summer when their parents are working and they're not in school. The answer is yes, they do, mostly, but libraries are open, rec centers are open, so, summer feeding programs are open, um, all kinds of re church, church uh, recreational activities are open all kinds of things in the community are open to help parents who are working uh, with their children in the summers. It's still a struggle, of course, but when we open businesses now, when workers have no choice but either to lose their unemployment or go to work, and they have to choose going to work because they can't make any money otherwise. So those students, their, their kids, in addition to, is it safe where I go back to work? Parents have to make that decision. What about my children? And you can, you know, in the summer, in a normal time, children can also be looked after by grandparents and aunts and uncles and all that. We can't do as much of that now either. So I think when, when policymakers, when governors make that decision, when's school going to be open? What are we going to do with these businesses? They they have to start considering what kinds of programs are in place, what kinds of helps help is are in place for 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 parents of kids that, I mean, I, my, my, I have two daughters who live in Columbus. Uh, both have husbands, both have small children under seven, both have two children. Um, I know how they struggle and financially, they, they, they both have jobs, both couples, both in each couple, all four of them have jobs. Um, they aren't rich, but they're solidly middle class. Uh, they, I know how they struggle with all of this. What, what are they doing with kids and how hard it is you know, they've got to be teachers. There's a newfound respect for teachers in this country now when parents who weren't trained to teach have to teach their kids, plus work around a full-time job and all that. But um, these, are, these are very real problems that many governors haven't thought much about. And I mean, I, can, I, I, I know DeWine's thought about it. I, I don't know that he, I don't agree always how he's addressed it. Um, but I also know a lot of governors don't even think about this stuff. Maybe it's because they don't have small children. Maybe it's because they were not engaged in raising their kids and there's why I don't, I don't put that judgment on them, but some, something's wrong when parents, when, when policymakers don't think about coming back into the workplace. But 
I, I just don't have a way to predict the fall, but all these considerations should be made. Right, there you go. Um, so let me, let me give you Kelly's comment real quickly before we move on to another topic. Um, so Kelly Prather just responded and said, thanks for answering the question. I appreciate your efforts and Governor DeWine's efforts with the nursing home strike force. So Kelly, thanks for that comment. Um, here's a question from Dr. Clyde Henderson. Uh, Dr. Henderson says, what in your view is the president's hesitancy to fully use the Defense Production Act in order to ensure adequate testing materials and PPE for not only healthcare workers, but essential workers and the public? That's my question too. And that's my question too. <laughs> I don't have a clue. I, I asked the president, start, start back with this, 2018, President Trump, fired a, 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 an admiral who ran an office of 45 people called the Global Security, the Global Security Consortium, Global Health Security Consortium or Task Force or something, Global Health Security. His job, the, um, the President Obama had set it up. Uh, before that, pre the, the admiral had worked for President Trump and or President Bush on anti-malarial efforts around the world. Um, President Trump, uh, uh, Obama then set up this Office of Global Health Security. His job with 40 people was every day to look out at the world and surveil potential, any potential health problems, viral or bacterial outbreaks in Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, Australia, anywhere, North America, Central America, whatever, to surveil the world. And if he found them, if he, whatever he found, to send in American public health workers to stop those diseases before they even really started. To keeping an epidemic from developing, and if it were an epidemic, keeping it from being a pandemic. President Trump eliminated that office. I wrote him a letter in March or April, April, I think, of 2018, asking him to reinstate the office, asking him why he didn't do it. They then made cuts in public health. So we simply weren't prepared for this. And think about, think about our countries. One of the best, one of the greatest things about our country is in Cincinnati played a role in this, as you remember, with Dr. Saban. We, we essentially eliminated polio in this world, um, alleviating the fears of so many people of my parents' generation. Uh, we stopped smallpox, which killed hundreds of millions of people in the 20th century. We stopped diphtheria. Um, we, President Obama led the charge in stopping the Ebola, of Ebola outbreak. Um, we know how to do this, and President Trump has failed. He failed first by firing that office. He failed by not not doing something when he was first told about um, this, epi this, this epidemic before it was called a pandemic. Um, and then he continued to call it a hoax for weeks while Governor DeWine and other governors that looked ahead were actually doing something about it. I have no idea. I've called on him since February to use the Defense Production Act to make all these products. The first time he's really used it was when he, um, he invoked it to open up that meatpacking plant in South Dakota. And there's meatpacking in Cincinnati too, as you know, there's a couple of small meatpacking. They don't do the slaughtering, but they do the, the processing and packing. They don't have the same kinds of problems, but they got some where people work too close together and too fast without the protective equipment. And President Trump ordered that plant to be open again. He didn't order that they have the protective equipment. He didn't order that the meatpacking companies slow down the line so workers could could, didn't have to work so close together and so fast. And uh, it's an abuse of the, the, the Defense, of production, Defense Production Act. Um, and he has, he, he's used it where he shouldn't have and hasn't used it where he should have. And I have no clue about why. Okay. okay. Um, so here's a question from LG and it says, how can we turn already existing mobile screening units normally used at health fairs for scattered site screening for breast cancer and prostate cancer and diabetes, et cetera. But can we utilize or temporarily convert or use them for COVID-19 mobile testing and housing projects where we know social distancing is limited and um, communities um, are hard to reach in these areas? Can we discuss the possibility and funding? Oh, and that's from, that's from Victoria. That's, that's Sister Victoria Strawn. Um, Ms. Strong, I would love to follow up with you on that. If, um, if you would give to Aaliyah Brown that runs our Cincinnati operations, our assistant state director, or, or get it to Councilman Kearney, either way, um, get, your, get your name and information. And 
that's a very good idea. I, I know that screening is everything and screening in underserved communities is fall. I mean, it's fallen short across the board unless you work at the White House or unless you're a pro athlete and they want to test every day so they can get sports going in this country. But other than that, the testing has been pretty woefully inadequate, including, believe it or not, among senators. I mean, I, I'm okay with that, but I'm just saying that it's not, it's not gone much of anywhere except the White House in the frequency it should. Um, so I think that's a very good idea on how to, how to scale up testing in, in areas that it should be. So um, if you, if, 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 if Councilman Kearney, if you could get her information to Aaliyah in our office and we'll get her an answer. And, and I'd like to pursue that and find out more about what we can do. Thank you, Ms. Strong. Strong is her name, Strong? Victoria Strong, yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Strong. Thank you so much. Um, okay, this question is from Nikki Williams, and she says, this was a very important year at, as it was the year for the census. This pandemic has halted a lot of efforts to ensure that everyone, especially minorities, are counted. What is being done to ensure that these individuals are reached and have the opportunity to be counted? Um, you ask hard questions in this group. <laughs> I, the, the deadline has been set back, um, fortunately, uh, to get the census forms in. It really is a question of public education about with all the other things going on, getting your census form back. Uh, there will be follow-up for people that don't, but um, it's, it's not going to be the door-to-door -door campaign in the past. When people haven't sent in their forms, uh, then uh, usually, well, I think always, government has followed up the door-to-door -door visits to get the census information. I, I don't know how that's going to be done this year, um, but it's an, it's an important thing. And anybody listening, I would encourage you to, to uh, make sure all your family members are counted. Um, and make sure they're counted, you know, counted right here. Right, okay. Okay, this question is from Brenda E. Um, since, it is, since it has been documented that African Americans and other people of color are the most affected by, by this COVID-19 disease, why hasn't there been a push to go into those neighborhoods to test and treat those people? Uh, to tell someone who's had mild symptoms to go home and self-treat just exacerbates this situation. Um, I think it goes back to sort of who's in charge here and that um, there's not been the effort, there just hasn't been the national effort out of the White House to address this, this pandemic at its source. I mean, when the president denies it week after week that it's a problem and then he shifts from acknowledging it's a problem to we got to get to, we got to get people back to work. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing enough testing. We're not doing testing in all the right places. And I, I think that's really been the answer. I mean, I think that's been the, the excuse, but it's clear there should, there that, you know, you, you, you test, again, I'm not a public health doctor. If Dr. Roosevelt Walker, the since I medical side wants to weigh in any of this, he's certainly free to, or any other doctor in the call, but um, it certainly makes sense to me. You go, you test in the areas and then you do contact tracing in the areas where the, where the outbreaks are the most acute. Um, and, and you, you follow up with the contact and tracing in a way to, to contain those outbreaks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if Dr. Walker has been unmuted. Um, Dr. Walker, do you want to weigh Can in? You Can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Yes. Okay, great. The only thing that I would like to add is that our big challenge is that we just don't have enough kits to, to test everyone. And because of that, the testing is still selective and uh, we're still uh, deciding whom to test based on how severe their symptoms are. And um, it, it all gets back to, you know, a failure of leadership uh, from the president. Uh, and it's just uh, been very, very difficult to obtain the, uh, the uh, materials that are needed to do the universal testing that we need. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, well said. Yes, um, this, next, um, this is more of a comment from Ray B. This is really interesting. So Ray says, as I chatted with uh, a very patient and polite young man yesterday, I was surprised when he started ranting that the latest conspiracies that prove that COVID-19 was just a complete fake out. He seemed absolutely normal, yet he was well prepared to defend against my reason rebuttals concerning our battle 
against our corona nemesis. He even stated that the stats about the sick, about the sick and dying were simply a liberal exaggeration with no basis in reality. Go figure. And that, yeah. that's from Ray Boston. And well, the, the, new, the new Fox television, Wall Street Journal conspiracy theorists fed by, frankly, racists and people the I would say the underbelly of society, the people who have dealt in these kind of racial and bigoted theories are, they're saying, I don't even want to repeat them, but they're saying that, you know, doctors are putting coronavirus down as the cause when it isn't because they get paid more money to wait to take care of the patient. They were saying stupid things like that. Most public officials I know, and I don't even know their political party or care, but most public officials I know say that, that if anything, these deaths are undercounted because plenty of people have died from undisclosed, unknown causes that very well could be coronavirus. Uh, they're older people, they're in already vulnerable positions and they're not written down as corona due to coronavirus, they're written down of a stroke or diabetes or some kind of heart disease. And uh, these conspiracy theorists, I mean, we have a president of the United States that has played into this, that has emboldened them. Uh, you all know that. I mean, I you see it. You see it. It's got to be personal to you, to some of you. You see it all the time with what people are willing to say about race, what people are willing to say about about gender, what people are willing to say about people's faith. And it's all okay when you have a president that said there are good people on both sides. And when I, when I see some of these demonstrations, first of all, they're a very small percentage of the population. They get, they get outsized news coverage because they're colorful. They're carrying guns at the state house, as Reverend Sharpton said, or imagine if they're all African Americans and carrying AK 47s to the state house, what would happen? That was Reverend Sharpton's language. It's hard to dispute that. But some of them, a lot of them carrying Confederate flags, and some of them carry Nazi flags, carry swastikas. I, it's just unbelievable. But they are, they are a small part of the society. Our society's always had a, I don't know what the percent is, of people who, who played a race, who played a bigotry, who played this anti-immigrant fervor, these people that don't look like us, quote unquote. And that's who this group of people is. And they fill the minds of impressionable, not necessarily young minds. And I, it's unbelievable when you meet somebody that seems sort of normal and then they start talking like that. And I, I've got a, a sort of a friend, a guy that texts me all the time about, you got to investigate this. He, he's convinced the president was right about that. I, Dr. Walker, you'll appreciate this about the hydroxychloroquine. That if, if they had got, if we had, if we had listened to the president and got that out, that we'd have this virus defeat. And others, you know, I don't know, maybe they think if you swallow bleach, the president said that. So, I mean, it's just, it's just lunacy. It's this anti-science lunacy. And I, you know, I, I, I tend to believe in science. I mean, I didn't study much science in school, but I'm smart enough to know that scientists actually know things. Right. Yeah. And, and we've been warning people, don't swallow bleach. Please don't do that. That's, you know, that that's horrible. Um, so here's a question from my daughter, Celeste Kearney. And she said, is there any legislation pending to expand broadband into rural communities in certain urban areas? And I guess that gets back to the digital divide that you spoke with early on. Yeah, I, I did a conference call one day. Um, with a group of school superintendents um, from all over the country, all over the state, including one from uh, three counties east of you along the river, Adams County, and, so, and, and just listening to what their students deal with. And I think of what inner city students deal with, whether it's East Cleveland or whether it's Cincinnati Public or Columbus Public or Mansfield Public, where I grew up. And, you know, it's, it's, one, more, it's, it's, it's one more discrepancy, disparity that, that, that separates our society and gives kids who already have opportunity more opportunity and those kids who don't have much opportunity even less. And uh, so Celeste, one of the things, uh, I, I'm on the agriculture committee and one of the things we do is an economic de rural development title, if you will. And we're using that to get more broadband into rural and urban areas, but in this case, especially rural areas. And, you know, it means that businesses can't operate as well, students can't operate as well, individuals can't operate as well if, if you can't get access to the, if you can't get access to access to high speed internet. And it's something we've 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 got to get serious about. We've done an okay job at getting is at, at, at moving in that direction, but not nearly enough yet. 
That's right. Okay, so uh, Renee, are you able to unmute Joe Mallory because he has a question here that, that he could ask? Joe, go right ahead. Well, I had a couple hey, questions. Uh, Hi, Joe, how are you? I had a couple, how you doing, Senator? Good. I had a couple questions. Um, one was, you know, we've been watching the media and, and individuals screaming about their rights and getting it back out there and opening up. And these armed protesters who are threatening the legislators and in law enforcement's face, you know, pretty much, you know, intimidating them with assault weapons. You know, what is, you know, the temperature up there in the Congress about assault weapons bans and putting some kind of legislation in place that uh, they're not able to do that. You know, I know we're in a pandemic, but they're taking these weapons out there and it could spark a, a much larger uh, situation and incident. Yeah, I, I'm worried about that. I, as you know, um, gun sales have gone up during the pandemic. Uh, and um, just like they went up during the Obama administration, as you know, uh, Walmart, soon after the pres President Obama was, Senator Obama was elected president, Soon after that, Walmart put a limit on the amount of ammunition you could buy in for every customer at Walmart uh, because so many uh, conspiracists on the far right thought they needed more guns to protect themselves from this new president and all the things he was bringing with them. I mean, it's, it's all part of this conspiracy stuff. I, I would love to be able to put, a, put a, an outright ban on assault weapons to have uh, much more gun safety legislation passed. I've had an F rating and my political rating from the NRA my whole career. Um, but I also know that um, I'm not sure there's a Republican in Congress from Ohio House or Senate that's ever stood up to the NRA. Um, and as long as Mitch McConnell's in the pocket of the NRA and um, every Republican sent virtually almost every single Republican senator um, allows McConnell to bury any gun, any gun safety legislation we're not going to move on that. And if people can't see that now with these assault weapons protesting and screaming and yelling, mostly, not entirely, mostly angry white men with guns, with Confederate flags, with obscene signs in many cases. Uh, if we can't, if, that's, if that doesn't paint a picture that, you know, people like, people shouldn't have, people shouldn't be allowed to carry these assault weapons into public places like that. I mean, shouldn't have assault weapons, but they shouldn't be allowed to carry them into public places. So I, I don't know how in this political atmosphere we get rid of them. Right. My second question was- Sorry, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> with uh, antibody testing to see if someone who's had COVID-19, if you had antibodies that could probably, uh, with your plasma that could help someone else, uh, there's this thing called convalescent plasma. Have you heard anything about that? If it's a treatment option that is promising, and it, it can help people who have COVID right now, uh, I guess, recover quicker. Yeah, I, I might let Dr. Walker, if he wants to play on any of this. I, um, I think the science is inconclusive so far. I know that Rand Paul, who is a physician, represents the state and the other side of the river, who I don't trust for medical or political advice, he said because he had it. He didn't have to wear a mask because he can't transmit it now. I don't think that medical science doesn't agree with that, but he walks around the Capitol all knowing saying that. Um, I just don't think we know yet. I think the, the, um, the antibodies test tests whether you've had it, but it only tests whether you've had it and haven't gotten it within the last week. For instance, apparently your body begins to produce, if you get contract coronavirus, your body the Dr. Freed of the CDC told me this, the guy that ran the CDC under Obama last week, he told me this, that antibodies, your body takes a little while, a few days to produce the antibodies that fight the virus. Um, but so if you take an antibodies test, it will measure whether you're, you have those antibodies in your blood, you take a blood test, but it only registers from about five days back and earlier. So it's a helpful test, but I don't know that, I don't think medical society and science has concluded anything for sure about its use to cure somebody or to um, give somebody immunity. And I, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about it beyond that. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, Mr. Mallory, uh, the uh, convalescent, convalescent plasma is being used as a treatment option for some patients. And the safest answer 
about that at this point is to say that in some patients, they are responding well to the treatment, but other patients uh, are not responding and, or it doesn't change the course of their illness. So we don't have enough information yet to make a definitive uh, conclusion about the treatment, but it is being used in some patients. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Um, I wanted to just read a, a quick comment from Victoria Holmes, and she says, I would like to put the president and these conspiracy theorists in the corner of a room with a patient with COVID-19 um, in a hazmat suit and make them stay in the room for at least four hours and experience what the caregivers go through. I think that person's experience would change their mind about the theorists. So that about the yeah, th 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 Michael, what you just said, think about that, that, you know, you, I see how absurd you find those statements are from some conspiracy theorists. Think if you've been a nurse in a New York hospital and you've seen your friends, your nurse friends, you've seen the respiratory therapist, you've seen the woman who cleans the rooms, changes the sheets, you've seen some of them die, and then you hear these wacko theories. It's just got to make you throw your hands up. Right, that's right. Okay, so we only have five minutes left, everybody. So I'm going to quickly, let's see, uh, David and Brenda from This and That, they have a great podcast. Um, they say, hi, Senator Brown. Uh, this is Brenda from This and That. Um, I have two questions. First, how optimistic are you that Operation Warp Speed will deliver a vaccine by the end of this year? Um, and then her second question is, what message do you have for our youth who are graduating from high schools and colleges? Uh, in the middle of this COVID uh, pandemic. And then she wants to also say thank you for your service and all that you're doing for the state of Ohio and the country. Thank you, Brenda. I, I have no idea about when the vaccine will be available. I listen to people like Dr. Fauci. He is not optimistic. It comes before the end of the year. Uh, my, my concern is that, you know, we, for whatever reason, our president pulled out of the internet. There was an international conference uh, where all the major countries in the world who have science and scientists working on a vaccine all met to exchange information. Our president boycotted. He had our scientists, government scientists, boycott that because he said, we'll do it ourselves. I think that's pure lunacy. But the other problem is if they come up with a vaccine, if France does or Nigeria does or, um, you know, England does or Brazil does, are they going to share their are they, when they scale up production, are they going to share it with us? And this is a, this is a very much a two-step process. You develop the vaccine, three-step, I guess, develop the vaccine, then you do all the clinical trials quickly, and then you know how to scale up production and figure out the best way to get it to the most people in, 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 a, in a very difficult environment. I mean, it should go mostly to the people that are our frontline workers. Um, will it or will it go to people who have more connections than that? And that's, that's the struggle we do there um, and why this is so important that we work together to get this vaccine done as quickly as possible. Um, young people, this, this will pass someday. Um, I'm hopeful that we listen to young people and as I said earlier, come January uh, with perhaps a new government that there is real focus on climate and real focus on racial disparities. And that would really change the world and give young people a better launch into our into the future. But if we if we learn nothing, we continue this um, robbing the next generation of the kinds of opportunities that every American should have, regardless of gender or race or faith or anything else. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to give um, Eric a chance to ask the last question. Let me say to uh, Victoria Strawn, because you want the Democratic Party to hold counter press conferences after the president holds his, um, uh, you're calling it campaign uh, propaganda speeches. And so we're going to throw that idea out there. And Deborah Jordan, you want to know about some educational resources. Um, and so we're going to ask you to go to, to the COVID-19 communityresources.com website. For those of you who are asking about testing, next week we're going to have the entire session on testing. And we have some good news that's coming up about testing also. Um, so let me give Eric a chance to ask the last question about businesses, and then we're going to have to close it out. Renee, you have to um, okay. uh, there you Okay, go. thank you very much. Just quickly, I know there's not much time, but I just wanted to ask about um, 
is there going to be a way for small businesses to get some of this PPP money? A lot of it has gone to larger companies, but is there going to be an effort to get it to um, the, the businesses that are the majority of businesses, but they're all very, very small? And I, I know that we, we don't have much time, but. Yeah, sure, thanks, Eric. And um, thanks for that question. Eric, some of you know, and a few of you were on it, um, hosted a, a, a good size roundtable conference call with me about three, four weeks ago, Eric, um, fo focused on African-American businesses. Mostly, probably half the people on it were Southwest Ohio, and there were others from Cleveland and to Youngstown and Toledo, but mostly Southwest Ohio business owners who were having great difficulty getting in to the um, to these loan programs. As a result of that meeting and um, some comparable meetings around the country, we wrote a second version of PPP EIDL, the two major programs, where a specific number of dollars, billions of dollars, would be focused on smaller banks, smaller credit unions, smaller companies, smaller businesses, and minority-owned businesses through um, through CDFI and other ways. And um, we are it's really important we we force transparency on this and we force um, accountability it's clear this administration um, is all about helping their friends and their friends are wall street and their friends are the big corporations and they lined up at the trough first keeping people like eric's clients and business associates and friends and members away they got there first they had the connections that's why we wrote the second bill um, this, the, the, the second round of that business, those business dollars, uh, to make sure that those loans and grants could get out um, in more underserved areas. And it wasn't just people, it wasn't just businesses owned by people of color, it was businesses that were smaller and had less access to big banks and less access to, um, to powerful people, if you will. So your, your, that meeting you hosted really helped crystallize our thinking to get to get a better way to do this. Again, administered by an administration that doesn't really care very much, but we, we tightened the screws on them a little and we're gonna keep watching them and we're gonna keep shining a light on them. But thank you, Eric, good question. Thanks for having me on this. I'm sorry? I said, thanks for doing this. And oh. Jim, you know what I really liked is you waited till last to call on Eric and then you allowed Renee to keep his microphone off for the first third of his question. That was really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, Senator Brown, we really appreciate your time and all the work you're doing. Um, I see a lot of comments here. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Robin Ford said this has been so informative. We just really appreciate you. And so thank you so much. Um, you know, we, we really are so grateful. For all of you um, who are attending today, thank you for your questions. Thank you for listening. Please make sure you take the survey. You'll see it coming up on Zoom. Join us next Saturday at 4 p.m. We will be talking about testing. And we want to thank the Center for Closing the Health Gap for powering us up and all of our partners who are here with us today. Thank you so much to all of you, and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you, Senator Brown. Thanks. This was good. Thank you. Good luck to Sloan, Renee. Is she your, is she your only college-age student? She's Her my child? only child. <laughs> well, she's only child, okay. Yeah, she's very well, smart. So she's been, how's, how's she deal with being home with, with her mom like this? <laughs> She loves it. Oh, <laughs> well, you do, because she does. Huh? Um, you know, she she's managing. She can't wait to see her friends. She, oh, I'm sure. I can't imagine you're, you know, you're 20 years old or whatever and doing this, but it's different for everybody. Dr. Walker, how's your practice during this? What are you able to do? Well, actually, I'm I uh, am not in practice anymore. I'm I teach now. Oh, you teach. Mm -hmm. You teach at UC Med School. I'm at the I'm in the the department of OBGYN at Tri Health in the residence. Oh, Tri Health, oh, okay. Tri Health. Yes. Are you an OBG? So you're an you're an obstetrician gynecologist. I am. Okay. Got it. Cool. All right. Thanks. Good to see you all. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. Thank Eddie, you all. Good to see it again. And thank you, thank Senator you. Brown, for joining my, us. My next Eddie knows this, but my next door neighbor is his counterpart in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we really and value. You heard me say that five times, right? Late in all Eddie's doing. So cool. It's really it's a really important job what the Urban League's done. So thanks everybody. See y'all. Thank right. you. See you later. Take care. Right, Thank you, you share it. I'm Bye. Senator Brown.